Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And welcome to Think Tech Tech Talks here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Ethan Allen. I'm guest hosting for Jay Fidel today. And with me today is Tyler Harris. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you. Good to have you here. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a great tech talk today. Jay found an article the other day that he wanted to share and, and get out there because it, it's such an intriguing phenomenon that he, that he ran into. It was reported in the New York Times of a, a sort of experimental program now happening in Newark. So many cities, Newark included, have these surveillance cameras around. Uh, Chicago has 30,000 of these things. London has probably several times that number. These things are mounted on street corners, anywhere they, they scan. The police typically have access to them, right? They can run through. They, they've proven tremendously valuable post facto in, in tracking down criminals, seeing people leave the scenes, et cetera. What Newark has done that very few other places have done is they've made the access to these video images public. So people, men on the street can basically, if you've got a good internet connection, you can pull this up and you can choose, let's see, I wanna see on Fifth and Main here, I wanna see that camera, mm -hmm. what's going on in front. And that raises some interesting questions. But maybe before we get into the real, that real meat, let, let's mm -hmm. talk just a little bit about the idea of surveillance cameras. Mm -hmm. Now I sort of think they're, they're sort of good thing. It's like, hey, more eyes on the street, you know, keeps potential problems down, blah, blah, blah. What, what, what's your take? Well, I mean, having security cameras available, uh, especially for law enforcement use, is fantastic. They're great tools for gathering evidence, which can assist in future prosecutions of, of any subjects. Um, it also uh, gives a sense of security for uh, citizens of, of any community that employ these. Uh, so that way, um, they know that, that you know, they are being watched you know, for other potential individuals that may look to make them a victim. So it's a fantastic opportunity, but there are some downsides. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, if there, you know, that data gets hacked and stolen, mm -hmm. people could know where you are, where you aren't. Uh, they'll know that you're at work now, not at your home. If you want to take advantage of breaking into your home, that's a good mm -hmm. thing for them to know, right? Definitely. Uh, if the government chooses to use this to sway public opinion or whatever, to disenfranchise people or make trouble for some people, that they have some potential to do this, right? Absolutely. I mean, for every good thing, there's an equal, opposite, negative aspect. Uh, so um, definitely in this scenario, uh, I, I do believe that there's an equal number of, of positive aspects to, to this plan of action and how it's being integrated, but also there's an equal amount of bad reaction and bad possibilities that come with that uh, as well. And um, it, it'll be a great opportunity, you know, especially with this show, to be able to educate the public uh, with the different viewpoints and a lot of the, the viewers to make a good educated decision. Yeah, I mean, it, it, all technology is that way, right? From the first time some primitive person sharpened a stick and used it to get dinner, that's great, but he probably next turned around and used it to get rid of some neighbor. You know? Right, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, that, that's sort of the, the, how we always find our technologies, right? Definitely. So um, let, let's talk, let's go into this, what's called the, <clears throat> the Citizen Virtual Patrol in Newark. <clears throat> so the police in Newark have had a, a fractious relationship, I guess, with the Newark community. And as a, a way to try to help sort of integrate the community into law enforcement better, they sort of set up and said, hey, we're going to give you access. You can be part of this process, you can keep an eye on the streets, you know, you can be part of the, the process to make your own streets safer. And it sounds really good, right? I mean, hey, who wouldn't want more people helping keep an eye on the streets and keeping the streets safe? Absolutely, and, and the plan of action that they have in place is that they're encouraging citizens of the local community to observe this video feed, uh, report suspicious activity to their police departments, uh, so that way the police departments can react and then uh, you know, be able to confirm or deny the suspicious activity if there was a crime involved. Um, so it is fantastic, um, however, it's still kind of fundamentally flawed. Uh, the reason for it is because these individuals that they're encouraging to go on to the public feeds and uh, you know, view this video footage of the public, uh, these are, are un or, I'm sorry, they're untrained right. um, and, uh, or uncertified individuals that um, really leave it up to their perception uh, based on um, you know, whether it's suspicious or not. Um, so, and perception is typically problematic when you're looking at facts. 
Right. We, we all we all have biases. Mm -hmm. uh, many times we are unaware of our own biases, but we may be biased. Uh, uh, you know, women may be biased against men. Men may be biased against women. Black people may be biased against whites. Vice mm -hmm. versa. A lot of people have a lot of biases. Only some small fraction of which are we cognizant of. Right. Uh, absolutely. And so yes, if you see suspicious activity, it may depend who is doing that activity as to whether or not that's suspicious or it's just. Oh, it's just a guy walking down the street. Right, right. Um, th these preconceptions, uh, you know, they do pose a lot of issues. Um, you know, a prime example, uh, if you had an individual with their back turned to the camera um, and, you know, they were doing some rustling. Uh, an individual that's wearing a, a hoodie, you know, with, with baggy jeans uh, versus a, an individual in a business suit. Um, those, you know, preconceptions of the two individuals and what they might be up to um, are, even though they're doing the same exact act, uh, may be entirely different. Right. Um, so that's definitely a major issue. Right, and then this leads to the whole thing, yes, what, what do the police choose to respond to? And how do they make that choice? Absolutely, and you know, considering that these, you know, uh, these citizens, although their intentions are fantastic, um, if, if you have, let's say, 1,500 people watching a particular camera, and half of them find it suspicious, and then half of them uh, report it to the police department, uh, you now have, um, you know, roughly about 350 to 400 people that are now calling the phone lines um, for the police, reporting the exact same information. Uh, you know, even with some variations, you know, as as they see fit. Um, and then you also have to think about the limited police force and their ability to respond to these suspicious activities. And uh, so, one of the major concerns is is the increase of dispatches for these police officers, their ability to respond quickly to you know to crimes in progress. Um, and the ability to maintain that level of, of safety and security while still answering these, these um, potentially suspicious um, reports. Right, and, and different places have actually tried different techniques to get around that. So mm -hmm. I guess in Camden, New Jersey, they've set up cameras, and if you live near one of these cameras, you can apply to have access to the video to that camera or that mm -hmm. set of cameras, which begins to make more sense. You've got presumably some vested interest in that neighborhood and, and wish to keep you know, your neighborhood okay, right? Right. You're not liable to just randomly call the police for a prank or anything. Right. So, but again, there, there is this whole issue of training people, training people as to what may or may not be sus suspicious. If, if somebody comes up and rattles a doorknob, is that suspicious? You know, maybe that's a homeowner and he left, left the door open and then it's now not. Yeah. Right, definitely. And unfortunately, when, when you're observing from the outside um, and you're looking in, so for instance, someone that's watching this video footage, they don't get to see what happens to the left of the footage and to the right of the footage. They only get to see what's going on right there in the middle. Um, so for instance, you know, a, a, uh, uh, an individual that's walking into the frame, uh, let's say that they're wearing uh, baggy clothes, um, and it's a gentleman, but he's carrying a purse. In fact, he's carrying this purse very briskly. Uh, it could simply be that he got a phone call to the left of the image about, can you please bring my purse? Mm -hmm. And on the right side of the image is, is his spouse or significant other that's right. waiting for that purse. Um, so that's, that's a really good example right. on how um, you know, this limitation you know, kind of gives that, that issue. Yeah, so there are ways this, this could clearly go very, very wrong. And, and then it brings up sort of this whole issue of what's sometimes called the expectation of privacy, mm -hmm. right? We used to think, when we walked down the street, that we had some vague expectation of some privacy. Now we all know, uh, you'll see signs around saying this area is under video surveillance. You no longer have any reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, and anyone who believes that almost anything they do in a public space is private is sort of living a fool's paradise, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the thousands and thousands of people with video phones now and cell phones just hang out in their windows shooting stuff randomly. You're, you're... But absolutely. I mean, cameras are so mainstream now that um, the, the privacy concerns of these street cameras that are being placed up versus the you know, concerns of, of uh, you know, the privacy and just cameras in general um, are is kind of overshadowed a little bit um, since cameras are so readily available on our smartphones now. Um, at least the, the security cameras that are in place are regulated, um, whereas uh, individuals with cell phones and, and cameras you know, are, are unregulated. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, there is, there is a, a level of concern for privacy, you're absolutely correct. However, uh, 
to be fair, we almost really don't have a whole lot of privacy anyways, because we could be in any photo at any time, any video at any time, with entirely without our knowledge. Right, and, and what's even worse now, of course, with the technology being increasingly sophisticated, is if somebody can record you talking for about 10 or 20 minutes, and get a little video of you, they can basically then, there are tools that they can make you say anything they want. That they can literally make it appear that you are talking, spewing out hate speech, whatever they feel, feel like making you appear to do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, luckily, you know, there's there's recursive actions that can be used, you know, to to prove or disprove any video footage that were right. to come out. Uh, in, in digital forensics, you know, we deal with that a lot. You know, ensuring that a video is is original and, and authentic. Um, so, however, unfortunately, by that time that we do disprove a video, um, the damage typically is already done. Right. It's gone viral. Millions right. of people have seen it. They know it's fact now. <laughs> it, exactly, and it goes right back to, to uh, perception. You know, they they already assume that this is fact and they run with it. Yeah, and it's, and it's very hard to undo that kind of thing. People mm -hmm. thrive on bad news. I mean, sort of psychologically, bad news in some sense is more important to us than good. Absolutely. And therefore, we pay more attention to it. You know, it's more important to figure that wrestling in the, in the bush beside you is a tiger, rather than to think of maybe it's a rabbit that you can go after, right? <laughs> You're probably better off just making that other assumption. You know? <laughs> right, definitely. Uh, <laughs> you might live longer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, bad news basically gets higher priority in our brains, mm -hmm. and it lives longer, and it lingers, and it spreads faster. Um, there have been studies on social media now mm -hmm. uh, that show how basically bad news does it. More people spread it, more people spread it more widely. It's picked up faster by more people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and preconceptions also, um, you know, is, is incredibly important in that as, as an individual that logs into one of these cameras to look at the footage, they're already looking for everything suspicious possible um, because they want to be this great citizen and, and give back to their community and, and be able to, you know, make their community safer. Um, however, as humans, we typically like to see exactly what we want to see. Right. Um, so that again is another issue where um, you know these suspicious activity is now compounding, um, you know, based on perception uh, again. Right, and we all, we really will see what we both want to see and expect to see. I don't know if you've viewed that uh, a little perception test where there's people passing, bouncing a ball around, and you're asked mm -hmm. to follow how many times the ball gets passed and all. And during this, a gorilla, a guy in a gorilla suit walks through, and you're completely unaware of it. Uh, literally, nobody will pick up on the fact that the guy with the, the gorilla suit just sort of walked because you're focused on this other aspect of the situation, right? Right, absolutely. So yeah, people, each person watching this video footage has their own pre-mindset about what it is they expect to see, think what they'll see, mm -hmm. want to see, and all that's going to impact what they do see. <laughs> Absolutely, and um, you know, and that that goes right back to the the issue about you know the number of phone calls that are going to be reported, right. um, and then the demand on the police department at that time, and then also the the conception afterwards if the police never show up to that to that phone call. Right. Um, you know, so that there's there's a lot, uh, unfortunately, that that hinge on the perception of, of individuals within the community. Yeah, you, you almost think this technology needs to have something. Uh, sort of like what they do in a classroom now with the clicker technology so people can sort of vote. You know, and so the police could very quickly get a, a, a scorecard and say, oh, this particular camera is showing 16 people showing mild concern, three people showing serious concern, eight people showing no concern at all. Okay, well, we react yeah, one way. You know, if 25 people show severe concern and nobody else was on, it's like, okay, we probably should go there. <laughs> right, and that's that's definitely, uh, you know, that's one good, really good possibility for these security cameras. Um, the, the challenge with that, you know, would be you're going to have individuals that they turn on the live feed and they walk away from the computer. Uh, so now you're going to have people that don't find it to be a concern, you know, if that's the default action um, that's assigned for the voting process. Uh, and, but you know, also again, uh, you're going to have individuals that are going to be basing their vote entirely on a untrained mentality. Right. Um, so yeah, right back to square one again. Yeah. <laughs> there are certainly a lot of a lot of issues about this. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things to think about. The question, I guess, is we can't put this genie back in the bottle, right? Uh, the, the cameras are out there now, mm -hmm. cameras up by the thousands, by the ten thousands, probably by the hundreds of thousands across the country, probably by the millions, actually. Right. 
uh, it's going to be used. This data is already up in, you know, up in the cloud, being stored there, being viewed, being analyzed. So, so the question is, how do we, how do we deal with this? How, what, what, what kind of pr uh, process do we use? And maybe before we get into that, I think we probably need to take a quick break here and, uh, about, and then come back after one minute and see it. Tyler Harris is with us here. We're, t we're talking about uh, public access to these uh, surveillance cameras. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on FinTech Talks, and we'll be back in one minute. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on FinTech Hawaii called Konnichiwa Hawaii. Broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel, one of the hosts of Asia in Review, which is broadcast Monday afternoons on thinktechhawaii.com. We cover, we study news and politics in and affecting Asia. We work hard to bring you the most interesting subjects and guests who will raise your awareness. Please join us Mondays every week on Asia in Review on thinktechhawaii.com and also on YouTube and iTunes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then. Aloha, she she, and saijian. Ethan Allen here, hosting uh, Think Tech Talks in place of Jay Fidel, who usually does this show. Uh, Tyler Harris is with me today. We're talking about the issues of uh, surveillance cameras in cities, and in particular about allowing public access to those images and having the public then become part of the eyes on the street. And I've been sort of playing uh, the, the positive side of this, thinking of all the good things they can do, how this can help the police. Tyler has been uh, putting more perhaps realistic slant on it, pointing out the, the problems with the, the data that we'll get and all. And that, that does lead us to this, this whole issue of the, the sort of the quality of the data, right? And, and how do you judge that? How do you sort through your data? I mean, it's one of those huge amounts of data. Mm -hmm. So um, now all these cameras are going to be connected to a digital uh, video recording device, uh, commonly known as a DVR. Um, so these videos uh, are going to be assigned, typically within a server, when they're stored, they're going to be assigned a file name that incorporates the date and the, the, uh, um, the camera number uh, associated with that. And then it's sorted, you know, of course, so that way the information can be easily located, you know, for evidentiary purposes later and, and extracted. Um, but it does kind of raise the concern as well about this footage that's there. Um, since it is available to the public, anybody can, can keep a recording of that footage, uh, whether it's for good or bad purposes. And because this information is being stored in a cloud environment somewhere, um, it does become a more a, a high profile target for, for hackers or anybody else that may seek to use the video footage for negative purposes, mm -hmm. uh, such as um, uh, extortion or blackmail or anything like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and people clearly want to use this for different things. Uh, if you have a, a confrontation with police caught on cameras here, some people are going to want to use it to exonerate the police and say they acted rightly and professionally. Mm -hmm. Other people probably want to use it to sort of prove just the opposite, right? Right, exactly. Uh, in my experience, um, yeah, especially in Texas, uh, I w was uh, working for a, a private investigative firm doing digital forensics. And what I can tell you is that I have uh, you know, a lot of interaction, a lot of experience with uh, field uh, private investigators that conduct surveillance on, on uh, individuals and subjects. And what I can tell you is that these cameras are an excellent asset uh, for information collection uh, in support of, of uh, private investigative cases, uh, very much so in the same fashion as, as police departments. Um, so you know, there, is, there is that negative aspect as well. Um, however, on the positive aspect, you're absolutely right as far as the issues that could occur if they're caught on camera and the accountability that comes from that, um, especially since these can be you know, exported as an evidentiary item to hold anybody accountable for anything, which is fantastic for transparency and trust in local police departments. Yeah, but I mean, it breaks down to individual stuff, right? Mm -hmm. you, you've told your spouse that you're going on a diet and they, they see you stopping in the donut shop, you know, like, <laughs> oops. You know, gotcha there. Uh, right, um, but it, you know, it really boils down to, you know, for those that are incredibly security heavy, uh, you know, the, the viewpoint is pretty simple. If you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to hide, so don't worry about it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, however, from a, a citizen standpoint of, hey, I'm an individual, I'm an adult, I deserve my privacy, mm -hmm. and this infringes on my privacy. 
And that's, that's really the, the two big aspects there. And it's nice because they're trying to meet halfway in the middle with these security cameras over there in Newark. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, unfortunately, you know, um, there's still a lot of misconceptions about it as well. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Again, that gets back to the earlier issue we were discussing. What, what expectation of privacy do you have, and what does that really mean in this day and age? Uh -huh. From the security aspect as well, um, you know, when you look at these security cameras, there's a lot more questions than just the camera itself, right? right? So the camera's available, but what software overlays are a part of that camera? Is spatial recognition? What about audio recognition? Right, which apparently aren't part of the current system in Newark. Well, right, correct. Uh, but you must start somewhere. Right. Exactly. So, you know, you turn around and you start by saying, hey, we don't have any of this technology. We're just going to install the cameras. Right. And then everybody gets used to it. And right. in five years from now, you reapproach the subject and you say, hey, why don't we go and put in some facial recognition yeah. so that way we can nab all these people that are on the wanted list. Right. Um, you know, so... It opens up that book to push the envelope a little bit further down the line. It does. It sort of put, puts you on that proverbial slippery slope, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Of having more and more of your information be more and more in the hands of other people, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the other aspect, too, since these are publicly available, um, there is the possibility that a third-party company mm -hmm. could take that video, create the overlays, and then turn around and sell a for-profit video feed uh, you know, based on uh, the facial recognition or anything else that they add into the overlay. Uh, so th there, there are possibilities there as well. Sure. There was a, a, one of these articles that was, they were discussing a case of a surveillance camera that was located near a, a gay bar, and some police officer was basically taking this, getting them license numbers, tracking these people down and trying to use it to extort money from them so as to not expose them. Right. Yeah, really, really. Steamy stuff, mm -hmm. uh, very, very ugly, uh, very much a downside. So it, it sounds like one of the things that we're here or really in agreement on is that with any system like this, some degree of public education is going to be a really key component, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, if we leave it up to, to conception, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, perception, and um, if if we don't educate the public on the pros and cons, the, the positives and the negatives, and everything that could occur with these systems, um, then we're going to be leaving it up to imagination, which is horrible. Um, so, you know, if education accompanies these cameras and the, and the uh, citizens of that community are, are educated uh, as far as how they work, what they're being used for, and uh, the potential downsides, um, and, and they're okay with that, I think it's fantastic. Uh, but not every community might be okay with that. Right, yeah. Uh, you can see, I thought it was very interesting that this was being tried in Newark as, a, as a, sort of, I think, a, a desperate bid to try to get, heal some rift between law enforcement and the broader community. And more power to them if they, if they can make that work and, and actually get people on, on, on board. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, so th then we get into that area. How do you make this data more secure? How, how do you stop the abuses? How do you try to uh, make the system work as well as it can work? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that's an incredibly complicated answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there's a lot of security needed um, on the camera side as well as the server side. Mm -hmm. um, there needs to be a, a encryption, uh, preferably a 256-bit encryption or better, uh, between the server and the camera what itself. What do you mean by 256-bit? Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, AES 256-bit encryption is um, a quote-unquote military-grade encryption uh, that encrypts the data so it's not easily readable um, You know, if anybody were to intercept that data in between. Um, now, on the server side, everything should be encrypted there as well. And so what it does is if I were to, say, uh, hack that live feed or if I were to hack that server, um, any information I pull from that is going to look like gibberish. Um, right, so as long as that's in place, which it should be, I, I would imagine that um, um, you know, that the, the uh, technicians responsible for that camera system would already employ that. But it's not impossible to steal the information steal. Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's that. Um, as far as for the live feed offered to the public, every time that a live feed is pushed out and individuals are able to gain direct, you know, direct, direct access to that feed, um, there does raise the risk that there could be a potential hack in progress or that it's already being hacked and observed. Um, and, again, this is worldwide. So anybody in any country can hack that system. Right. Um, so and that's, that's pretty important to remember. Yeah, and, and then there's, there's all, all these other sort of odd associated risks, right? Somebody who's in a witness protection program, for instance, just walking down the street, 
And suddenly, you know, Joey the Knife sees, hey, there's the guy who put me behind bars 20 years ago. You know, right. now, now I know where he lives, right? Uh, definitely. Uh, or, again, uh, spouses who have taken their kids to leave an abusive situation, and, and suddenly if the kid is running past one of these cameras and the spouse who shouldn't know where the kids are now knows. I mean, how do you stop that stuff? Uh, unfortunately, there's not really a good stopping with that. Um, it, you know, if there was anything such as a restraining order, uh, you know, that legal document would would be the protective factor. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> not very effective. Right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you're absolutely right. That's 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 the case. It's just it's not effective sometimes. Um, however, it goes right back to and how much privacy are you willing to give up to increase the security of the community? Um, and for new work, they they determined that this was a reasonable. Um, uh, compromise between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, unfortunately, without having that facial recognition, the camera would never know to blur out that face as it went by mm -hmm. uh, for a witness you know, uh, uh, protection program um, participant. So uh, it's yeah. it's a catch-22, no matter how you look at it. Yeah, but, but I, like, I like what you, you just pointed out, that in a sense, every community has to, or should, come together and make a decision about this kind of technology, which is sort of rolling out now and say, do we want this, do we not? Mm -hmm. Here are what we see as some costs, here are what we see as some benefits, here are some real potential downsides, here are some real potential gains. Right. Let's talk about this, have a civil discussion about it, see if we can find some common happy middle ground, we'll, we'll keep most people satisfied. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe may, may I'm naive, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just as long as the public education was out there to educate the public that this is the intended use, these were all the potential downsides, um, this is what we look to gain from this. Um, and as long as the community is all on the same page and they kind of eliminate that uneducated perception, then I absolutely, uh, that, that would be the way to approach it. Excellent. Well, thank you, Todd. This has been great fun and very educational for me to, to discuss this with you. I've enjoyed this, and I hope you'll come back and join us on Think Tech Talks next week.